Uh, so, uh, the kind of go-to line in 2020 is, 2020, what a year, right? Eh? Um, I would love for you to just take a moment and have a chat with the people around you. I want you to answer this question. Just about 20 or 30 seconds. If we went back a year, so December 2019, and you happened to, remember that? Remember that? How good was that? <sighs> anyway, December 2019, and someone sent you an email, you got a text message, and you knew what was going to happen this year. You knew what was happening. You knew, hey, global pandemic around the corner, and only knew, you knew what would you have done with that information. What would you have done? Those people who are saying start a toilet paper factory, well done. But have a chat, 20, 30 seconds. What would you have done if you knew about the pandemic, if you knew what 2020 was going to be like? All right, what do we got for answers? Who had uh, buy stock in Zoom? A couple of, yeah, kind of Zoom stock options. Any other great ones? Buy sanitizer, hand sanitizer, that's good. Someone said travel. I thought they said gravel this morning. I couldn't understand what they meant. I just nodded, but travel, traveling is good. Great. It's interesting, you know, information and data if you knew what was going to happen, if we, I kind of told you this is what 2021 is going to look like, you would hope that it would adjust your actions right now, wouldn't it? You'd kind of think if you knew that kind of stuff, this would be incredible. We're about to read a story uh, that has part of the story you find on your Christmas card and we sing about, and part of the story we definitely do not. Um, but nonetheless, it is a critical and important part of the Christmas story. So if you have your Bible... Turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. We have it on the screen as well, so you can follow along uh, with me there. It's a chunky reading, but try and get everything in it. It's a pretty cool one. Matthew 2 says this, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and they came to worship him uh, and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. That's when you know you carry some, you know, stress. When, when you're stressed and the whole city is stressed because, you, wow, that's pretty intense. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found them out, and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And if you remember the old cartoons, this would be the part of the cartoon where you hear that music, you know, Dun, 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 because that's like, you know, bad guy music. That's like a bad guy lie. After they'd heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child was with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened all their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in the dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time that he had learnt from the Magi. Then what was fulfilled through the prophet Jeremiah was a voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, 
an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what had been said to the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. Now, uh, we have the three kings on Christmas cards and the star, but we don't have some of that other stuff about the little kids and stuff. If you've got that stuff in your Christmas cards, guys, you are buying your Christmas cards from the wrong place, okay? If that stuff's in your Christmas cards, bad, bad, bad. This is quite um, an interesting one, isn't it? See, this guy, Herod, had a unique experience. So imagine being Mary, okay? You're a teenage girl, and uh, an angel comes and says that uh, you're pregnant, and the uh, baby growing inside you is going to be the savior of the world. Now, I'm just assuming, but I would say, ladies, that would be mildly stressful, right? A little bit anxiety-inducing. Or if you're a a guy, and you're sleeping one night, and you get woken up uh, from a dream, and in the dream, you've been told, listen, your fiancé is knocked up, uh, but it's okay, it's going to be the savior of the world, and you woke up from that dream, you'd be a little bit stressed, yeah? A little bit stressed. And you'd go uh, to your fiancé and be like, so I had a dream don't know how to tell you this. She's like, you had a dream. Wait till I tell you about my day, all right? Uh, and you kind of share this moment, and you go, okay, we're doing this. And probably for the first day or two, you'd be like, okay, yeah, wow, this is insane. Probably about a couple of days later, you'd go, did we just, did we just eat some, like, off cheese and imagine that whole thing? Like, did I really see an angel? Uh, You know, Joseph might have been like, maybe I had, you know, a coffee too late and I just hallucinated that dream. And uh, I don't know. And you'd kind of have nothing except this common experience that they talked about, the dream and the visit. But there'd be moments, right? Surely there'd be moments when you think, did that really happen? That's like, that's all I'm working on is, did that really happen? Probably a bit later on when, you know, Mary starts to show, she's like, no, 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 it definitely happened. Baby, it's happened. I can feel the baby. It's real. Uh, But nonetheless, for the majority of their pregnancy, they're kind of living off the faith of this moment that I think this happened. Right? I mean, even the shepherds in the field, you know, they would see the, the, the angels and the sky lit up and singing and all that kind of stuff. And they'd go off and do their thing. But probably, there was probably some moments where they're like, did we... Did we imagine? That was so crazy, right? That was so insane that it happened. I mean, once upon a time, I remember like doing the best shot into a dustbin with a can. And I know it happened, but there are still times that I'm like, it was so amazing. Did it happen? I know it's not comparable, but it's pretty close, okay? (laughs) Savor of the world being born, me throwing a can into a bin. But there were still times that I was like, did that really happen? But Herod is a little bit different. See, Herod had something that not many people have had, in fact, no one has had in history. He didn't even, he had more than like Mary and Joseph. See, he had these people come to him and say, hey, so we live really far away and we spend our lives, our careers studying the beliefs around the world and we have found something in your history that tells us that a savior is being born. In fact, we know it from your, your like history, your studies, your scholars, your records, but we also see it in the sky and that tells us Something's going down. So we've come all the way here because we believe this. And so he kind of parks them over here and he goes and he gets the religious leaders. These guys who have devoted their life to building on the studies of those who have come before him. Okay? Bunch of, you know, professors. And he says to them, hey, can you tell me a little bit more about this Messiah, this Savior of the world, this King of the Jews? And these guys submit their peer-reviewed articles, you know, where they've kind of talked about things, and they say, well, this is what we believe. We know with 100% certainty, we speak as one, this is what's happening. And so this guy, Herod, has all the data from these guys and all the data from these guys, and he is the only person at that moment who has all the information. He is the most informed person in the whole Christmas story, the most informed human. In fact, he's the guy who got the text message back in December, pandemic around the corner. He knew it. He understood it. He, more than he knew it, he understood it. He believed it as true. He absolutely believed the information at his hand. He knew everything that was going to happen in the Christmas story. 
This kid is legit. This kid is going to be the king of the Jews. This kid is going to be the savior of the world. This is happening. This is prophesied. These guys from far away have said it, and these guys have devoted their life to this. Say it. It's happening. And that caused him such a tremendous anxiety that the whole city of Jerusalem felt it. So how does a guy who knows what's going to happen get this so wrong? How is his response one of anger and violence? How? Isn't it insane that the most informed person in the Christmas story was the most insecure person, was the most violent person? How does that happen? So I'll tell you a bit about Herod. Herod's title was Herod the Great. Think about that for a bit of an ego, all right? He wanted everyone to know, I want to be called Herod the Great. And Herod really early on in his life set his ambition and his trajectory for success and significance very early. He wanted people to know who he was. He wanted his name in the history books for eternity. He wanted Herod the Great to be everywhere. And so he campaigned and he got to know people and he schmoozed the right people and he sucked up to the right people and he bought people gifts and he hung out with the right crew. He did all the things he needed to do to get ahead. He had a beautiful wife. He had a kid. He was like, we're going up to, you know, we're moving on up. Here we go. And as he went along, he kind of realized that, you know, his, uh, his wife was just not at the social level needed to advance. But there was this other girl that he had the hots for and if he married her, things would go better. So he told his wife and his kid to get lost. He exiled them, all right? And he married this woman that he loved because, you know, she'd get him further along. I don't know if that's a romantic story. It's a weird one. Don't watch that, you know, around, it's not a rom-com movie, but, all right, goodbye wife and kid. Hello, new wife. You're better for me politically. He made lots of friends. Him and Julius Caesar were good mates. He actually made really, really good mates with a guy called Mark Anthony, and Mark Anthony side chick Cleopatra, okay? And uh, he was really tight with these guys. And he hung out with them all the time. And uh, in fact, to the point where uh, he was made, you know, kind of like a, a leader in the area. And he began to grow his influence. Because he was based in Judea, he decided that he had to adopt the beliefs of the people there. So that maybe that will help kind of get him a bit of favor. He'd be part of the in crowd. And so he became a Jew. And he began to kind of build his reputation. Then there was the split, as you know, after Julius Caesar's death between Mark Anthony and Octavius, two guys vying for the role of Caesar. And Herod makes a decision to back Mark Anthony, his mate. And he goes and he supports Mark Anthony, looks after Mark Anthony. And if you know your history, Mark Anthony ends up losing, and Octavius, who renames himself Augustus, wins. Now you'd think if you've backed the loser, you would go into hiding. But not Herod. Herod walks up to Octavius and says, yep, I was against you. I wanted Mark Anthony to win. But as strongly as I was behind Mark Anthony, I'm going to be right behind you. The way I was backing him, I'm going to back you. I'm your man. And it works. It works. Octavius makes him king of Judea, gives him that land and says it's yours. And Herod begins to grow his influence. He begins to do that by saying, I want you to remember who I am. So he builds thing after thing, castles and fortresses. In fact, Herod is the guy who rebuilt the temple. And one of like, the elements of that building is still standing. It's called the Western Wall. That's Herod's. And on everything he built and everything he did, Herod the Great stamped in. Herod the Great did this. Herod the Great did this. This is a guy so consumed, so consumed with his success and significance that when he looked at his family and he saw his kids growing and growing old, he thought, these kids could kick me out. So he killed a couple of his kids off. And that wife that he loved, he thought, mm, she's getting pretty close. To so he killed her off as well. He killed his in-laws off as well. Now, I know for some of you, for a long time, you're like, what an evil guy. And then I say he killed his in-laws. You're like, oh, maybe he's just misunderstood. You know, I get that. <laughs> all right. It's light shade, this gray, people learning. You know, some of you are like, Look, I don't agree with him, but I understand him more. I'm beginning to connect with Herod a little bit, okay? He's not that bad, all right? This is how petrified the guy was. In fact, one of the last things Herod did, he was king for about 30 odd years. He, he came to uh, power when he was about 36. One of the last things he did was to go back and find that son and kill him. The first one, just in case. This is the kind of insecure guy 
Because everything he looked at was, what about me? I'm going to lose my throne. I'm threatened by this. I'm, my, my significance could disappear. There's going to be another king. There's, there's going to be a baby. There's a baby born now, and it's foretold in history. This kid could take my place, could take my legacy. And so his response to that, with all the information, is to go and find this kid and make sure that the kid is dead. Because for Herod, what mattered, what really mattered to Herod was who's on the throne, and it needed to be him. It needed to be him. When I was uh, in pre-primary or kindy, I got cast in my kids, uh, my, sorry, my kids, my, in the kids Christmas play as uh, an American Indian. It's just how it rolled, right? Uh, you think that's kind of racist, but there were two other white kids there who were astronauts, so I'm just figuring they were just making up roles for us left, right, and center, all right? And uh, it was, I was, look, I was okay. I was pretty great as an American Indian in the, in the group, but what I was really vying for what I wanted was shepherd, okay? I really wanted shepherd. So next year, Christmas production, can we make it about, can I get my role, shepherd? I'd really appreciate it if you made Christmas all about me, all right? This would just help me heal some old wounds. So I wanted to be a shepherd. I thought I'd be great as a shepherd because when I read the Christmas story, I kind of thought that would be my vibe. I don't know who you relate with uh, in the Christmas story. Maybe you think you'd be a great shepherd. You know, maybe you think you'd be an amazing wise man because you're pretty wise, or a wise person, how about that, 2020, hashtag, right, okay? And I used to think that's who I resonated with, but not once did I read the Christmas story and think, I resonate with Herod, Herod's my guy. <laughs> It'd be pretty awkward if I did, right? You know, but the more I read the story, the more I kind of see myself in Herod a little bit. It's pretty embarrassing. I like to think that when the throne of my heart is threatened. I would happily give it up for Jesus. But in reality, I don't live that way. I'm pretty protective of who's in charge. Sometimes I find myself treating Jesus uh, like I would treat my kids, you know, when I put them on my lap in the car and say, oh, you can drive. You're driving. Good job, buddy. All right? And they're sitting in my lap, and we're just going around the car park. When, you know, they're not really driving. I'm doing all the driving. I kind of, you know, hey, Jesus, you can sit on my lap. You're running my life. Yes, you are, Jesus. You're doing a good job. Look at you steering, Jesus. Oh, oh going so fast, Jesus. Right? And that's how I kind of think it might be. But in reality, it's not, is it? Jesus isn't really the king of my life. And in fact, even though I wouldn't go out there and kill a bunch of kids, trust me, guys, I wouldn't. Don't do that. Okay? I don't have the kind of power that Herod did to do that. The extent of the power I have, I tend to exercise when it means to protecting my throne. When it comes to protecting the crown, the extent of power you have and I have, we tend to exercise when it comes to protecting the throne of our lives. See, the issue for Herod was this. It wasn't a lack of information. It wasn't that this guy didn't know enough. Isn't that crazy? Out of all of humanity, this guy had all the data and all the information at the right time. You ever had that thing of hindsight? I wish I knew that back then, right? You ever had that? You wish you had the hindsight? This guy had it at the right moment and the right time. He had it. We would all love that. The only person in history, the only person in history to understand the significance and the magnitude of that moment in time. He had all the data and he believed it. But his insecurity and his desire to make sure he stayed on the throne meant that what came out was fear and violence and distance and oppression. It wasn't information he lacked. It was surrender. He could not let Jesus be king. And that is difficult. Because I resonate with that in a way that makes me so uncomfortable. Because when 2020 comes my way and I lose control, my hand grips the throne tighter. When I have the opportunity to exercise just a little bit of control, when every other control has been taken away from me, the areas where I get to be in charge, I hold that tight. I want that. So Jesus, you can be king of my life, but can I just be the governor of, of like my privacy and my relationships and my emotions and my money and my time? Can I just be the governor of just this little area? And you know what's crazy? 
Herod should be afraid. Herod should have been freaking out. He, did, he was right to be afraid because Jesus is king. He is, and he was coming to turn things upside down, and he was coming to do something incredible, and he was going to step in there and say, I don't share this throne with anyone because that's what Jesus does. And it should scare you and I when Jesus says he wants to be the king of our life because it means we step out of the throne. We step away from the crown, and he is the only one who holds it. He doesn't get to sit on our lap and pretend to drive. He's it. But you know what? He's a good king. He is a good king. Not one who goes out there and kills others to protect his security. But he's the one who gives up his security and dies for you and I. And in this year, everything inside of us might want to grab a hold of the steering wheel. And as we look at this idea of the gift, we think that the gift is the offer of Jesus being in charge. But really the gift is this. Jesus is king. And specifically for a bunch of you here, maybe for some of you, you resonate with Herod even more. You might be coming along to church for a long time, coming with your friends, hanging out, whatever your reason is for being part of this conversation, watching online. And you haven't made the decision to surrender your heart to God, to say to Jesus, you're king, you're it. I give you, I give you control. I, I, I call it for what it is. But you know everything. You know in your heart it's true. You know deep in your soul that Jesus is real, that he died on the cross for your sins, he defeated death, and he wants to be in a relationship with you. He wants to be the king of your life. You don't need more information. You know the information already. But you have stopped short of surrendering. Tonight, I'm looking at you and I'm saying, it's on. It's your choice. You can do that. Stop waiting for more information because you got it. Make the decision to surrender. Now, we don't serve a God who says, uh, if you miss this stop, if you just miss this opportunity, that's it. You're never going to have another opportunity again. We don't, we don't serve that kind of God. We serve a good, gracious, kind God. But the sooner you get on the bus, the sooner you connect with him, the better. The sooner you have that opportunity, the moment you get into a relationship with a good king, the better. And here's the crazy thing. For all the buildings and all the Herod, the great stamps, for all the relationships and the death and all the stuff that he did to make sure you never forgot his name. For most of us here, the only reason we know him is that he's a bit part character in the story of the Savior of the world being born. It's the only reason we know him. All this effort poured out to make sure no one forgot his name. The only reason we know his name is that he was in the background of the Jesus story. It's a powerful moment. Do you see yourself in that moment, maybe? You have an opportunity to surrender to the king, not just the baby. You have an opportunity to surrender to the king. Now, you might be following Jesus for a long time, and you're doing this already, which is fantastic. Thank you. Keep doing that. Or maybe like me, you kind of realize that this year, in a moment of crisis, man, I've gripped a hold of the crown in my life and held it close, you know, close to me more than I normally would because... Everything else is taken away or I'm a bit uncertain, so I need to feel control. And tonight is your moment to go. It's time to surrender that back to Jesus, to say, Jesus, you are king. Because Jesus is definitely king, and he's not a king who shares the throne. He said some pretty crazy things when he was alive and walking the earth, and he says some pretty crazy things now that he's alive in heaven. Things like, all in, baby, I am king. I've come to turn this world upside down. And so that offer is there with you. But if you choose to have the information but not to surrender, you will constantly live celebrating the arrival of hope, but you'll never know the fulfillment of it. You'll be like someone drowning in the ocean, struggling to breathe, and as you're drowning, someone throws a life preserver down, and it lands next to you. And hope has arrived. And you are excited. You are so grateful. You celebrate the arrival of hope. Once a year, you gather your family around and you have dinner to remember the arrival of hope that came a year ago when the life preserver landed in the water. I mean, you never grab hold of it, but you celebrate its arrival. 
You give each other gifts to remember, you know, remember last year when it arrived? But you never grab a hold of hope. That only comes with surrender. That only comes by saying, hey, that baby born grew up to be a man, grew up to be the king who died on the cross, who paid the price for what keeps me separate from God, and who ushered in a new kingdom. Herod was right to be afraid because it wasn't just be a baby being born. It was a proclamation that said, here comes the king. Peace on earth, goodwill. A new kingdom is starting. Something new is happening. So my encouragement to you is when you read the story of Herod and you see some guy who acts in a really weird way, realize what's beating in his heart. The guy who's so disturbed that everyone around him knows it because he cannot have someone else threatening the throne. And yet the whole point of Jesus' arrival was to say, a new kingdom is being born. Hope has arrived. And it's this offer that is placed out before you. And you can look at it and you can celebrate it. Or you can surrender and do more than that. Know the fulfillment of hope in your life. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand what it means. I pray, Lord God, that you'd help us to grab a hold of what you're saying to us. That you came to be king. You are king. And I pray, God, that you would help us to understand what it means to surrender the throne to you completely. We ask, God, that you would just give us the courage to be able to do that well. And maybe in moments in our life when we forget that we gave you the controls, when maybe we've gripped it just a little bit tighter, we've tried to push you out of the driver's seat, maybe that's that moment right now. God, would you help us just to release it back to you? King Jesus, the good king. Not always the safe king, not the tame king, not the one who will do whatever we tell him to do, but truly King Jesus, Lord, Savior. And while we're in this posture of prayer, if there's anyone tonight who resonated with that story of Herod quite significantly, and you said, hey, that's, that's kind of me. I've been coming along to church, and I've been kind of sitting here and engaging here, and I know the information. I know in my heart that this is real, that this is, there's something here that I can't deny is real, but I have not made the decision yet to actually surrender and say, Jesus, you are king. And tonight, you would like to take that opportunity. You'd like to make that decision. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love for you to signal that decision by just, just lifting your hand so I know who I'm praying for and just letting me know where you're at so I can just pray for you in this moment. Where maybe you've come here and you're going, I want to know if this Jesus is real. Thanks, guys. Lord, would you see these hands that are raised? Would you see these people who are indicating that in this moment, in this space right now, they invite you to take up your rightful place as king of their lives. Would you bless them? Would you encourage them? Would you strengthen them? We thank you that we can only do that because, Jesus, you lived and you died because of the things we have done wrong that have kept you away. The, the fact that we want to live our own way, do things our own way. And you reconcile us through your death and through defeating death back into relationship with you, God. Would you help us, Lord, to not just try to ride out the rest of this year, but, Lord, rather to surrender the next few weeks especially to you, that we would end this year knowing that with you in charge, with you on the throne, nothing is wasted. You are still glorified. You are still lifted up, and you can still do great things. In fact, you have been doing great things. So, Lord, be lifted up. May you find a bunch of people here who honor you, exalt you, identify you as our King. 
Lord, we thank you that with that hope in our hearts, we can walk out strong and confident, even if things don't go our way, even if circumstances don't fall in our favor. You are still king, and we still serve you. And you are a good king. And the story doesn't end with our lives. It starts with your reign. It never ends when we're with you. You are still king, and our hope is not what happens in our lifetime, but our hope is in you, the one who holds eternity in his hands. That is a safe place to be. In your name, Lord, and for your glory, we pray. Amen.